I'm Brett Vandenhubel. I'm the director of Columbia Riverkeeper. And we're a nonprofit that works to protect the Columbia here in Washington and in Oregon and along its whole path through British Columbia as well. And um, I'm really happy to be here tonight from our, I, I live in uh, from your River Gorge. And uh, these fossil fuel export projects are having a tremendous impact on the region where I work and throughout Washington. So really happy that Washington Environmental Council and many of the other partners are, are trying to address this here tonight and having this community forum. So look forward to all of your comments later tonight. And uh, we're going to have a nice, uh, great panel and a time for some questions and answers afterwards. Um, quick overview of the issue. So the state of Washington and the Pacific Northwest are facing unprecedented proposals to transport oil and tar sands that we haven't faced before. In short, the oil companies face a problem. We have areas in the, the Bakken oil field in North Dakota, uh, oil formation throughout the Intermountain West. We have tar sands in Alberta. I just learned today, actually, I should have probably known this, but in Utah, there's now active proposals to strip mine for tar sands. And they want to increase this drilling and get it to the West Coast. They, they, they say these, these proposals, the, these mining formations are stranded and, and we're a key part of this, the transport through the state of Washington. And so these proposals are from new and expanded transport of oil and tar sands through our region, which obviously comes with a lot of risks to us and our environment, our communities and our environment. So today we're focusing mainly on oil by rail and the marine transport issues. And there's some experts here to discuss those issues. Um, about a year ago, I read an article in Bloomberg uh, that, that said that oil companies are buying up rail cars like drunken sailors. And, and that image stuck with me where they've, you know, there's a lot of pipeline proposals as well, but they've realized that they can transport oil with, by rail, and there's a mad rush, a new gold rush to do this in the Northwest. So, for example, the Port of Vancouver, Washington, I'm going to do a little shout out to the Columbia River here. Um, the Port of Vancouver, Washington recently approved a lease that would allow 360,000 barrels per day to arrive on trains in Vancouver, Washington, be transferred to ocean going ships, and shipped down the Columbia River, crossing the Columbia River bar, and bound for U.S. refineries or for export. Um, a couple of folks here made it up from Vancouver, Don and Alona Stanky are here, and I've been doing a lot of work on, on that as well, as well as some other folks from Vancouver. There's similar proposals in Grace Harbor. There's three oil terminals, by oil by rail terminals in Grace Harbor. There's proposals in Puget Sound. We've never seen this kind of onslaught of proposals of shipping oil by rail through our communities. To give you an example of uh, the scale of one of these in Vancouver, 360,000 barrels per day is 42% of the Keystone XL pipeline. So Keystone XL has been a major focus point in the environmental movement to try to prevent that oil from moving, and nearly half of that is now being proposed to being shipped by, by rail instead of that pipeline. So it's a massive, massive scale. Um, there's many organizations here that are working on this issue, and many individuals and um, to, to get a better understanding of how this works, our safety protocols, the dealing with oil spills, and some, frankly, to just try to stop these proposals because, uh, because of the harm that they would impose on our communities. We believe that the time is now. Um, these decisions are going to be made, yes or no, within the next year for many of these proposals. So this isn't something to, to look at in the future, study these impacts. If we want to weigh in on this, the time to do that is today. Tonight our format is going to be two sets of panels. We're going to have three panelists um, with some questions at the end. So we're going to pass around some question cards. If you could write down some questions you have during the presentations, and then we will read those. 
We'll also do it a little more informally where we can pass a microphone as well, around as well. So we, we'll have both of those formats. But if you want to jot down a question, I can read them to the panelists at the end, or if you want to just raise your hand at the end. But let's let the panelists go through and, and finish their talks. So could I uh, invite the first panel to come on up to your, to your stools? And, uh, and, and I'll introduce you. So I'll introduce the second panel when they are done. Um, each person is going to have about 10 minutes. So we're going to keep this fairly short and moving so that there's time for discussion afterwards. But on our first panel, this is the order in which they speak. Um, Eric DePlace from the Sightline Institute will speak about oil transport in the Northwest. Uh, Kristen Boyle is an attorney with Earth Justice. We'll speak about current threats in Washington. Kristen just had a big victory in the Grace Harbor uh, proposal. And and Matt Crowe with Forest Ethics is going to talk about crude awakening in Washington. So I'm going to hand it over to Eric. Thanks, Brett. Uh, so one of the first rules of public speaking is only to speak after people who are more boring than you. Um, so I'm going to model good behavior by boring you guys, uh, so that my fellow panelists. Was that uh, about Brett? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was not about Brett. Well, the next part. The next part uh, was that you should never go after a singer uh, because that really um, uh, will put me in shadow. Uh, so I, I'm going to do this um, as quickly as I can. We're going to blast through here in 10 minutes, but we're going to start. Um, Almost literally with a 36,000 view. Ah, okay, so uh, Silent Institute, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're a sustainability research center. We work across the Pacific Northwest on a range of issues, not all of which are connected to the environment, and not all, all of which are connected to energy. Uh, but I've been spending the bulk of my time over the last couple of years on coal and oil, uh, and we're going to talk about that stuff tonight. Um, and I will be happy. Uh, to go into details of any of the stuff later on. Uh, I've written um, several reports and a bunch of blog posts about many dimensions of this. Um, but I'd like to start with this map, this super simplistic, overly simplistic map that is totally right. Um, because what this map does um, is it drastically simplifies a complex story, um, but it's, I think, you know, a basic truth out there, which is that uh, if you look at these red uh, deposits, these are big fossil fuel deposits, as Brett said, stranded in the center of the continent. Um, so you can have the Tiger Basin coal fields, the Alberta tar sands up there, the Bakken formation of oil there, and all of that stuff, uh, in some sense, wants to go uh, to the world's hungriest energy markets. The straight line between those places, the most economical way to transport that fuel, um, takes us right through this little green line of the Pacific Northwest. Now, as um, I think Stephanie and Brad later on will describe, the fuel doesn't actually fly there in a nice little red arrow. Uh, it takes a, a somewhat more challenging path than that. But I do think this fundamental dynamic is what's driving uh, a lot of the activity we've seen and that we'll continue to see in the future. And it's a, it's a basic fact of geography that is both um, troubling news for a region that has prided itself on clean energy leadership, um, but also pretty bad news for the fossil fuel industry from the perspective of having to take this stuff uh, through a region that is arguably more hostile to coal and oil than any other region um, that they could have to move their product through. Um, so as I was saying, We've heard a lot about coal exports in this region over the last couple of years. I suspect everyone in this room knows somewhere between uh, a lot and a medium amount, at least, uh, about coal exports. Um, but the, the story of oil by rail movements is really just the next chapter in that. It's a chapter that will encompass the Bakken oil and will also encompass the tar sands uh, fuel from uh, Alberta. And also, frankly, um, touches on natural gas as well, which I'm not going to talk about tonight at all. Um, if you think about all of those proposals, all of, and this is by the way, all of the new proposals. Oh, these are all of the proposals that are now on the drawing board, serious proposals in permitting in British Columbia, Oregon, and Washington. Not counting the existing stuff, new stuff, and add them all up, and count the carbon inside of them. This is what it looks like. Coal, oil, gas. Um, this is Keystone XL, by the way. This is Pacific Northwest. But those three commodities of fuel that are planned for export through the Pacific Northwest on a carbon basis relative to Keystone, it dwarfs Keystone. It's not even close. That's not to say the Keystone isn't important, but the stuff that this region is facing right now in terms of expansion plans uh, is absolutely titanic in its dimensions. How's the sound? Is it, can I stop without this? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good. Getting, we need strong voices. Yeah. Uh, 
I'll leave it at that. There's a lot of carbon in there. Uh, let's take a quick look at um, what the oil industry looks like um, from the perspective of tar sands oil producers. The tar sands is right up there. Um, that's kind of uh, where that most of that stuff gets on a pipeline. And right now, um, you've probably heard a lot about Keystone XL. It wants to move uh, through the sort of the center of the country to the big refining centers in the Gulf Coast. Um, that's a huge, huge pipeline. Um, it's obviously been a flashpoint for environmental controversy. Um, the problem from the perspective of the oil industry is they run into Bill McKibben and uh, the, you know, the rest of us uh, who have uh, really made this thing a, a, a very dicey proposition. Um, there are some speculative routes east. Those aren't really uh, going concerns at the moment. Um, the other big uh, alternative for them, though, of course, is what's um, happening north of our border. There are two very serious pipeline proposals in British Columbia. Uh, the Enbridge Northern Gateway up here, Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain Pipeline in southern British Columbia. Um, that now does uh, feed some amount of tar sands uh, into Washington State refineries and ultimately into our gas tanks. Um, NGOs, First Nations, and others in BC have been very effective uh, at um, putting the brakes on that northern pipeline. The southern one is an expansion proposal. Uh, it's a very serious threat and it would move uh, a lot of tar sands uh, into our region. I, however, am an optimist and I believe that we're going to um, ultimately figure out a way to severely delay that and ultimately kill the expansion of that pipeline which would be good news, and is good news, except that the rail companies um, are still looking, or the, the oil companies still are facing this fundamental dynamic. They've got these unpopular products stranded in the middle of the continent, uh, and they want to find a way out. So what I suspect the Alberta oil sands producers will do is what the Bakken oil producers right here are already doing, and that's put their fuel on trains. This map is a look at um, oil by rail proposals, some are actually already active. Um, the first oil train arrived in Washington in September of 2012. So we are 14 months into oil by rail in Washington. Um, that first one went to Anacortes, the Tesoro facility, designated in yellow, Tacoma, there was a small refinery there is already taking oil by rail, as is a, a site uh, on the Oregon side of the Columbia. In addition to that, we have the other red dots, uh, all of which are very far along uh, in planning for oil by rail. Um, there are a cluster at Three Grace Harbor um, that we'll talk some more about tonight, and then a huge one at the Port of Vancouver um, that Brett mentioned is um, pipeline size all by itself. I don't know if there's a bigger one in the country, actually. Um, I won't get bogged down in the numbers tonight, but suffice it to say, we can and should go through and understand the dimensions of each of these, including um, what they mean for rail and vessel movements, because they're very serious. In order to understand sort of the magnitude of the change in the energy economy um, that these uh, proposals would bring, I kind of put together this. So this, on the left-hand side, I stack up basically, um, this is the Vancouver proposal right there, uh, and layer on uh, every barrel of oil on top of that. Contrast that to this column, and for those of you who can't read that, that's the Northwest total refining capacity. So the number of projects we're seeing far exceed the region's, to refine the, the, the region's ability to refine the fuel. Uh, even if you took out all of the other sources of fuel that, that we now take from the North Slope or from pipelines, um, the, the stuff that's on the drawing board for oil by rail would dwarf it all. Um, and uh, to me, this is one of the key uh, pieces of the argument that makes me believe that ultimately this is not a story about taking North Dakota oil and refining it here for domestic use and energy independence, yay. Um, this is ultimately a story of exports, this is ultimately a story of taking, taking U.S. oil and exporting it, and ultimately it's a story of taking Canadian oil. Uh, right through our communities and exporting that as well. So in that way, uh, just as with the geography, it's a very similar uh, question that we're facing about whether we are going to be enablers of a huge new supply of fossil fuels uh, into world markets for consumption and combustion and carbon emissions. Um, by contrast, these are the two pipeline expansions proposed in British Columbia, both very big, very serious environmental fights, but smaller than the oil by rail in Oregon and Washington. So it's a big, big deal um, from an environmental perspective. This is a little more carbon map that I just sort of threw together um, recently. And this, the, the idea here is to contrast the oil by rail from a carbon perspective to the, the coal export uh, fights that we've already been having, which we know are a big deal. This is Gateway Pacific, this is the Bellingham coal right here, this is the Longview coal. Um, each roughly would produce, the coal would produce about as much carbon as the entire state of Washington produces in a year. Um, so it's a lot of coal, it's a lot of carbon, it's very dangerous from a climate perspective. Uh, you know, this is the Vancouver proposal all by itself uh, with two different gradients on there depending on whether it's Bakken fuel or tar sands fuel. This is the aggregate uh, of all the oil sands proposals, or all the uh, oil by rail proposals, rather. Um, and as you can see, you know, we're talking about 
um, fairly drastic increases in the amount of uh, kind of throughput carbon, even though we don't usually count it that way. Um, you know, if you think about it, Washington's, you know, kind of from every activity, every business, every resident in the state kind of consumes about this much in a year, or emits about that much. Oil by rail would, um, uh, would be a lot more. And in addition to all of the uh, sort of climate and energy and environmental concerns, and I didn't even touch on oil spills because um, my colleagues know a lot more about that than I do, um, uh, I should mention that there's a very, non, a very important non-environmental reason to be concerned about this, and uh, that is that the oil trains, um, particularly carrying the Bakken oil, uh, do have an unfortunate tendency to explode and kill people. Uh, this is a picture from Quebec earlier this summer where an oil train carrying the same kind of fuel that is now rolling through downtown Seattle three times a week blew up after it derailed four cars and 73 car train blew up, killed 47 people, leveled about four blocks of town. A train in Alabama, very similar to this one, uh, blew up two weeks ago. Thank goodness in a rural area where no one was killed. And do keep in mind that these oil trains are right now rolling through Seattle's front yard and along Edmonds and all along the Columbia Gorge and through Spokane. Uh, this is real, this isn't made up, this isn't fear monitoring, this isn't hyperbole. These trains blow up, uh, and that's a real problem. Uh, and we should be, needless to say, and we should be thinking about that um, from the perspective of keeping our communities literally safe from exploding death trains. Uh, so I'll leave it with that, uh, and I'll stop ranting now, uh, but I'm looking forward to um, the rest of the discussion and questions, thanks. unfortunate uh, task of telling you about the current threats of free by rail in Washington in a little bit more detail uh, than Eric's, um, Eric's great overview. Um, and of course, I think people have now said this, I think every participant will say this, why are we having this? Why is this coming to be? And it's because the oil that we're talking about moving is inconveniently located mid-continent, which is a quote from one of the documents we had in a, in a recent case. Uh, that circle there, that's the Bakken at night. Uh, that's how much methane, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but that's methane just off burning uh, as brightly as, you know, Chicago or New York. Or, um, the Alberta tar sands are, are north of there, but that's the area that they, uh, that the oil is. Uh, that is not much good to an oil company, and so that's why they need to move it through, <laughs> through our shores. Um, and we're talking about North Dakota, Bakken. Uh, this is a picture from a few years ago. There are more uh, paths like this in the North Dakota region for the Bakken. It's tar sands, oh, that didn't work. Um, there are two pictures there, um, but um, the tar sands in Alberta, which are an ecological disaster, uh, all, of, all on their own, that are moving this way. Um, this is actually not my car, but that's right. Um, <laughs> well, it's my car, but this is not the most recent car. <laughs> it is my car, but it's not. A little practical joke. <laughs> um, all right. Um, this is um, this is this. They are, we are talking about rail from a lot in a, through a lot of small towns in uh, Washington, uh, which of course the rail ends up with oftentimes uh, with disastrous uh, consequences. In Grace Harbor, um, we have a, a current situation, and the the applaud was nice earlier, but the thanks go to the Quinault Indian Nation and uh, the local environmental groups in uh, Hoquiam and Aberdeen, Friends of Grave Harbor, Surf Rider, Citizens for Clean Harbor, who really stepped up and fought a, what is in their communities, uh, unpopular battle uh, against uh, two proposed, and what will be three proposed, oil terminals, oil by rail terminals, uh, that I believe we have uh, stopped for round one, but the battle continues. Um, this is the Port of Grace Harbor. These projects are proposed right here, you'll see there are already tank farms there. The way these projects, uh, the proposal for these projects is that the, the uh, crude oil comes in by rail to the turf here, stored, and then out through the estuary to ports and points unknown. Um, when we were doing the uh, case, it was clear that the proposed, the companies, the proponents did actually have any, didn't know precisely where they'd be shipping it. It's possible that some of that oil could have just gone up the coast and back into the Washington refineries at Cherry Point, which would have been a ridiculous waste of transportation, uh, but possibly also to California. Um, this is the Westway Terminal. I'm not really sure what's going to pop up next. 
This was one of the. <laughs> this was one of the. Uh, this actually has been. Uh, this is one of the uh, one of the proposals. Uh, that's the Imperium not so renewables terminal. Um, the Imperium renewables was of course is of course a biodiesel fuel right now, but they've decided that that is not um, that is not a profit source, and so they are proposing to become approved by rail terminal as well. This is the third one proposed for U by U.S. development. So three terminals in this one small harbor that would do a throughput of millions of tens of millions of barrels per year. Uh, each one of them is about. Each one is probably about 10 million barrels per year throughput. And remember, a barrel is 42 gallons of oil, so it's a lot. Uh, that's the summary of the, of the amount that we're talking about through Grace Harbor. And you're talking about the rail traffic in, and you're talking about the ship traffic out, all being uh, 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 a bother, at the, at the very least, and a real dangerous problem uh, at the most, and also a uh, source of the concern for the oil spills and oil spills in the area. Um, this is the, uh, the we move south, sort of south, south and inland a little bit along the Columbia River. People have talked about this is the this would be the uh, so I should say for these projects what we did get uh, just last week was a uh, a ruling from the Shoreline's Hearings Board which sent these projects at least back to the city for a renewal of the or redo of the permits because they failed to look at all of the environmental consequences failed to fully disclosed to the public what was going on. Uh, hopefully, the uh, State Department of Ecology will make sure that a full environmental review process is done, uh, because that is the only way that, obviously, I think that Hopium will actually go forward with that. But that is one of the reasons I think you're in sort of round one, is that it now goes back. These companies aren't going away. They, they do see themselves as, um, as, as going forward eventually. Um, Columbia River, the Tesoro Savage, uh, Vancouver Energy Distribution Terminal, uh, slated for Vancouver, uh, Port of Vancouver. It is, uh, there it is on the Columbia River. It is a huge project. Because of its size, it goes through a different licensing scheme than the other uh, proposals have in Washington State. That licensing scheme is, um, is through a state agency called the Energy Facility Site and Evaluation Council, which is FSEC. Um, they're talking, as Brett said, about 360,000 barrels per day throughput um, at this terminal. Um, that comment period, they will do a full environmental impact statement. The comment period on that proposal closes in December 18th. That is the address of Mr. Posner. Um, we're you know, hoping to get lots of comments into the, into the um, board to talk about how important this is. Um, those are the new, the, the new new proposals. Those are the proposals which are the ports from the from the rail to the tanks to the boats. Um, Washington State, as you all may know, has is the home of five refineries, uh, oil refineries, uh, uh, two up at Cherry Point, two at Anacortes, and one at Tacoma. This is the Ferndale Phillips 66 refinery. Um, this is uh, a lovely picture. Um, and what? What a, actually, I love this. I actually have to, have to shout out. There is a gentleman who has named Mike Robinson who has a website, uh, who, and he likes to take pictures of industrial beauty. And so I actually asked him if I could use his pictures, and he said yes. So good credit go to him. He has some fantastic shots of the refineries with beautiful scenes in the background or foreground. Uh, one of the things I want to point out here is those are tanks, and those uh, look an awful lot like the tanks in the other facilities. And one of the questions that arises from looking at Eric's graph and the amount of refining capacity we have in this state and the amount of oil that's being proposed to ship in is whether or not the refineries are ultimately thinking about themselves just being storers and shippers out of oil as they come in because there'd be no reason why they couldn't do that um, given their current configuration. Um, the three of the four refine the big three of the four big refineries already have their permits for uh, through by rail terminals and are actually operating those already um, because that was a very very uh, small decision really local land use decisions went by unnoticed by many folks uh, the only one left outstanding is Shell uh, they have not yet applied um, this is yet another one of the beautiful pictures from Mr. Robinson uh, and this is really what we're the most concerned about in our region we're concerned about all of it blowing up is important um, but um, but the, the tank of traffic through the Salish Sea 
the uh, inevitability of oil spills, big or small, when you're talking about these kind of projects in our area. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I hope I have the right presentation as well. Uh, my name is Matt Krogh, and I work for Forest Ethics. We're an organization based out of San Francisco, Bellingham, and Vancouver, uh, D.C. Uh, a uniquely, I think, cross-border effort to actually try to protect forests. And my core. Thank you very much. Is that better? Yes. yes. <laughs> Um, and in the business of trying to protect forests for ecosystem and human health, we made the unfortunate discovery, as you're all finding out more about tonight, that underneath the boreal forests of Canada lie tar sands. And so we've spent years now trying to create an unbroken wall of resistance in BC uh, against tar sands being exported through pipelines uh, through the Salish Sea. And I'd like to see a quick show of hands, actually. First off, who uses the phrase Salish Sea? That's awesome. It's spreading. It's really rare to see that many hands. Second thing, how many of you know that today, roughly 80 or 100 tankers a year are coming through the Salish Sea with tar sands from Vancouver? It's a lot fewer hands uh, for those of you who are up front. This is an amazing thing. One of the things that we're trying to do is get the word out. But first, I want to talk about the context in which we are talking about tar sands and crude by rail. This is the context. The graphs that you saw from Eric were talking about throughput, how much is coming through in any given year. And one of the questions that I have is how much pressure there is for each of these types of fuels coming through. This is a, these are some numbers that I put together, and I've asked Eric to vet them, which he has not yet done, and he will someday. Um, but this is billion short, billions of short tons of recoverable carbon in each of the deposits he showed you. This is the Bakken oil that they're telling you that they want to export through these various terminals. This is coal in the Powder River Basin. Anybody here been involved in fighting coal trains, coal fights? Awesome. Good. Um, me too. I've been that for the last three years. Um, but this is the part that scares me. That's the amount of recoverable carbon in the Alberta tar sands. And when they tell you that they're building oil terminals to export this, and they run out, that's what's coming behind them. I'll make it work, I'm sure of it. There we go. Um, just because nobody's mentioned it so far, I wanted to say climate change. This is the context of all this. We're talking about exporting massive quantities of carbon. We have some of the hottest years on record. Immediately behind us, we have sea surface temperature that's impacting storm strength. <laughs> We'll do, we'll do Christians if you want. Um, and then with the coal fight, we've had an incredible uh, impact on actually stopping terminals, delaying terminals, making a real impact. Um, I'm in that picture, a bunch of people in this room are in that picture. And we've had real leadership from the tribes as well. Uh, in particular from the Lummi tribe, opposing the Gateway Pacific Terminal. And so this is what I want to address broadly, very quickly, which is that there are multiple different ways that the threat of oil coming through the state impacts us all. I'm going to talk first about pipelines in BC, I'm going to briefly touch on tankers, which we can have an entire panel about, talk a little bit about rail and what we can do about it, and then there's refineries and terminals. Um, this is the view roughly from my office uh, in 1999. We here in Washington have experience with pipelines and pipeline safety issues, as they do in BC. This is a Kinder Morgan pipeline. There's no safe way to transport this stuff. I swear you I'm pressing the same button. <laughs> <coughs> Continuing with the theme. <laughs> wow. Can somebody help? <laughs> All right. There we go. I found a different button. <laughs> uh, so. In British Columbia, as we're trying to oppose these pipelines, these are the ones that Eric was pointing out earlier. He didn't put any real numbers on it. We're talking 590,000 barrels a day uh, proposed for the new Kinder Morgan pipeline solely for export. We're talking 525,000 barrels a day for Enbridge and over 600 new tankers a year that will be coming down either through the Salish Sea or through the outer coast. We've seen real resistance, again, from First Nations and tribes. And one of the fun things about this picture, this poll was carved by uh, Lung Nation carver Joel James. 
in order to bring people together on the coal fight. But along the way, I ended up integrating the tar sands fight as well. And this uh, totem pole now stands in the uh, Tsleil-Waututh First Nation in downtown Vancouver, where we've seen incredible First Nations leadership in fighting tar sands. We've also seen a whole lot of people step up to fight these pipelines. Uh, a quick question, how many people have really noticed the Enbridge pipeline in the news? The Enbridge pipeline was the number one news story in British Columbia last year. There was no bigger news story. Um, this is one of my colleagues, Ben West. We had five, 6,000 people in the streets at a rally on Saturday because of the upcoming decision about the Enbridge pipeline. And here's something that you can see a little bit more about from Fred and some other folks. Uh, the Sailor Sea is directly under threat from these pipeline proposals and, in particular, the points that Kristen and Eric both made. We have the Kinder Morgan pipeline that can be bringing tar sands through the Sailor Sea, but also each of the four refineries can be a transshipment point to take tar sands or Bakken oil out to other ports. One of the things they didn't mention is that the American Petroleum Institute starting last week, is trying to overturn America's current ban on crude export using WTO regulations. So when they tell you, again, that they want to create these for domestic consumption, and they happen to be in the process of overturning our domestic laws using WTO, you can ask yourself, do they mean it? Um, so at Forest Ethics, one of the things we're trying to do is really highlight the fact that uh, tar sands are coming through right now. This is a new website we just put up. It's called Tar Sands SOS. You can track tankers that arrive to the Kinder Morgan uh, pipeline and track them as they come through the Sailor Sea. And Ethan, in the back, my colleague at the table there, he has a petition, a declaration to save our shore. And this declaration to save our shore will be using on both sides of the border to tell politicians that we really don't want to see this kind of risk come through our communities. Again, that's tarsandssos.org, and it works on your smartphone. This is one, it's a, it gets a little geeky after a while. We've been tracking the Pachincha as she goes back and forth from Vancouver to LA, where they offload tar sands, also the Bay Area. And uh, none of our presentations will be complete without blown up trains. Um, this, uh, for me, is actually where we talk about the worst of both worlds, because when we're talking about what's coming through in either Bakken oil or the tar sands, we're talking about oil that either explodes or in a product spill since. Um, I'm going to ask Ethan to, to raise our petitions again because there's one thing that's incredibly important about all of this is that we can actually limit their ability to bring volumes of oil through on rail. This is what they want to do in terms of volume. This is 34 new proposals around the country, uh, a map done by the NRDC, that these are all new rail offloading proposals. They add up to about two and a half million barrels a day. Again, we use the keystone as a metric. It's about triple keystone. And in Washington, we see the same rail routes potential uh, that we've talked about for coal for all these years with the potential for oil coming down along the Columbia, which Brett mentioned, and up through every population center of Western Washington. Uh, part of the reason this matters, this is a picture taken by the Hurricane Creek Keeper, one of my colleagues out of the Alabama, and his overflight. Uh, of the uh, explosion in Aliceville a week ago Friday. The thing that's important here is all these rail proposals depend on using a particular type of unsafe tank car. And right now, today, we have an open comment period federally with the Department of Transportation where you can ask them to get these tank cars, they're called DOT 111s, off the rail. And again, we have a petition in the back. Love it if you would sign that because the industry is acutely aware that they can't use these cars they can't expand this crew by rail uh, industry anywhere near as fast as they would like to. Um, finally, refineries. Anybody know that right now we have a pipeline coming to all the refineries, or the four Puget Sound refineries, all of whom are using tar sands? That's a lot of people. <coughs> four, four or five, it's unusual. Um, and it's associated with real emissions, and real emissions and human health problems, in particular with sulfur. This is what we're looking at around the country. This is one of the projects we've done with a group called Oil Change International. This is refineryreport.org. You can take a look. Uh, it's online. I believe it's up right now or tomorrow, maybe the next day. But when we talk about solutions, trying to get people off of tar sands, there are ways to find fuel that is not based on tar sands. Here's a little more detail uh, from each of these. I'm running out of time. Um, this, of course, is one of the, some of the detail down to the Puget Sound refineries. 
And finally, there are ways to make a difference. I've been asking you guys to sign petitions. There's actually a lot to do. Uh, we're going to hear from Bruce Wisher, I believe, on new oil spill legislation. It's something we can all get behind. We have problems right now that we can fix, regardless of what's coming our way. We'd love to get these uh, very dangerous tank cars off the tracks. One thing that, uh, that we don't have an agreement on, on exactly how to go about it, but we'd love to have people start advocating for moratorium on new oil infrastructure while we figure out what the real risks are. We're just not ready for this. Um, and finally, there's a whole bunch of different ways out there that we can actually lower demand, whether it's a statewide low carbon fuel standard, whether it's trying to get purchasing guidelines in municipalities, corporations, and the rest of it. And most important, you guys are here tonight. You're gonna hear a lot of stuff. The biggest difference you can make is spreading the word telling people what you've heard, and moving on. So, thank you very much.